Matt, there you are. How are you, buddy? Good to see you. I'm wonderful. It's great to see you, man. Good. So, uh, Matt, without further ado, uh, the next 10 minutes are yours. A really interesting opportunity here. I don't I don't know another one like it that does oil and gas in an OZ like you guys do. So uh, please dive in. Yeah. So uh, I've been listening all day or most of the day, Jimmy. I, I, I always comment on how much uh, I love the group and I'm in the same boat as you guys. I just, I, I love this tax law so much. So just on a personal level, uh, I, I've moved our corporate headquarters into an opportunity zone in the stockyards uh, just outside of the DFW area uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, I've, I've moved multiple companies of, of ours into op zones. Uh, and obviously I love op zones from an oil and gas stand, standpoint. So I am super excited. I did not count on the current election cycle to go the way it did. Uh, so I'm, I'm super stoked about some of the, the possibilities going forward that I necessarily didn't anticipate happening. So a uh, big fan on, on so many levels. And if anyone wants to ever chat, uh, op zone in every, in every way, shape and form, I, I just love it. So, uh, uh, I do apologize. My my presentation is on another screen, so I have to look up quite often uh, at the other screen. But I'll uh, I'll be here anyway. So, just a super super brief background of us for those of you who don't know us. U.S. Energy is is probably the most well known direct energy company in the U.S. Uh, we we control a pretty significant share of the market uh, in terms of capital formation. One of our structures is the Opportunity Zone. Uh, we are both an oil and gas operator as well as investor. And we really love everything inside the energy stack. Uh, a, a lot of what we do is joint venture, a, a, a lot of publicly traded majors, um, as well as other private families like ours. And we're, the last several years, the largest investor in everything that we do, whether it's an op zone well or traditional well or infrastructure, uh, everything that we do is is really done by us and our, our corporation first uh, and our family money. And then we bring investors alongside of what we do. So, uh, uh Pretty excited about the general space of what's happened over the last several years, as well as what's happening. And and Jimmy, as you know, I'm one who's less of, of a presenter than a conversationalist. So if you think there's a, a question that needs to be asked in the middle of my presentation, you can you can just cut right in uh, and ask questions. And for me, the best part about the app zone law is that this has been working for the last several years for us. So we started doing research back in 17, obviously 18, uh, executed our, our first funds in 19, and we're on our, our third or fourth iteration of doing the opportunity zone funds inside the energy space uh, and, and pretty excited about it. Obviously, I mentioned this, I'm, I'm super excited about what happened on the election front from an op zone standpoint. I find it uh, uh, to be pretty exciting of what's likely to come and, and some of the outsets of continuing on this tax law for so many of us. Uh, Jimmy and I were actually discussing this the other day. I'm probably the only person who doesn't want the current law to be extended uh, I want a new law to be passed. And I really like this short window of a capital gain deferral that's currently there. Uh, part of it, it has to do with the valuations and some of the tax discounts that you're able to get. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that we repass a new law and keep the current one expiring in 2028. Although everyone else I know is probably hoping it, it's extended to a five-year or seven-year rolling period. So I might be the only guy on the other side of the equation uh, and I'll discuss why. So very briefly, and I don't have time to do a whole macro presentation on oil and natural gas, uh, but the, the stark reality is consumption continues to be extremely strong globally uh, as our economy continues to grow. Uh, when you look at things like a the AI boom and the energy consumption, uh, we're doing nothing but going higher and higher in terms of uh, the, the demand side. Uh, it, it Most people would assume that being an oil and gas you're, you're you know, either for oil and gas or you're for renewables and you can't be for both. Uh, I think if the world understands the, the real consumption needs globally, you have to be an all the above kind of guy uh, or girl or believer. Uh, the reality is fossil fuels can't handle a two to three percent annual growth on a go forward basis. Uh, uh, fossil fuels will continue to grow, but probably at one to two percent of the growth. Uh, you can't go from a million and, and one to a million five to a million seven to a million ten barrels a day. There's just not enough production uh, to, to be had at this price. You'd have to have $120, $130 a barrel to justify drilling that type of level to, to get that type of supply to market. So we, we need an all of the above and, and multiple energy solutions beyond just fossil fuels because we're going to consume 20 to 30 percent more in 15 years, but we can't consume 50 to 70 percent more. There's just not enough. And, and that would put the world in a pretty calamitous situation if we're all fighting for fossil fuels. So uh, I'll, I'll skip the big macro 
because there's so much data I can share uh, and just focus on on, on more of the, the micro. Uh, uh, we're an extremely strong oil and gas and financial company. Uh, 80 to 90% of my revenue comes from oil and gas wells. It has nothing to do with the funds, even though we're probably the largest private uh, uh, oil and gas fund sponsor in the U.S., uh, really what we do is operate and, and invest in oil and gas wells. Um, and what I get really excited about is when these laws overlap what we do. So uh, it's important to me as, as an investment professional to think about, you know, not doing something for tax purposes, right? Not letting the tax ta tail wag the investment dog. But I really love when a tax law overlaps in a pre-existing thesis and opportunity. And for us, we got really fortunate with the Opportunity Zone Law and where the governors use the different census tracts. Uh, and as you really push forward and look at rural areas, one of the big benefits for, for us, especially in red states, was that a lot of the best reserves in the U.S. fall in regions that were identified as Opportunity Zones. Uh, in fact, the majority of the Permian Basin is an Opportunity Zone, and that's where we happen to drill, operate, and invest. So for, from our perspective, the, the overlap of a tax law into a pre-existing investment thesis is, is just kind of a boon to what we do. And, and when we looked at opportunity zones, you think about the traditional hanging chads or issues with opportunity zones that most people look at, right? This The 10-year hold being one of them, which I don't know if people realize that you don't have to hold for 10 years. You can get out of op zones or go to other op zones uh, within a 10-year period of time. But the other ones that people really think about are, you know, is this area have to gentrify and will it actually gentrify? Well, in oil and gas, you don't have to worry about it. It's already the best reserves in the best locations that are identified as opportunity zones. So you're not looking for location. Location is unlimited um, and, and really everywhere to be had. Uh, and, and our inventory of, let's say, 800 plus billion dollars we're drilling, probably half of it, if not more on every given year, is, is already in op zones, right? So uh, it, it's kind of just a, a natural uh, activity that you're already occurring. Uh, from our perspective, paying taxes in 2026, we don't need to have debt refinance distributions. The, the revenue that comes from oil and gas wells is so robust that we can distribute out enough that investors are able to pay their, their tax bill in 2027 from just taking a small portion of the annual revenue that's already coming from the well bores. So instead of reinvesting as much, you distribute a little bit more in 2027. Uh, and, and, and in oil and gas, we have tons of cash flow. In fact, we limit our distributions to 6% a year outside of the 2027 year, uh, and the rest gets reinvested. And for years now, this has been a, a great process for us. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a super interesting overlap of the tax law married with uh, a pre-existing opportunity. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go into it and, and get into the discussion here uh, of what we do and how we do it. And I, I don't think people really understand that uh, one of the big benefits for us is that original use or substantial improvement rule that makes it hard for real estate to provide an immediate return to investors doesn't exist in our world. When I drill a well, it's the original use of capital. And within several months, I'm already cash flowing back revenue uh, versus having to worry about when do I get debt and, and can I make distributions? We have so much revenue, we gotta make sure that we're constantly reinvesting it so that you don't pay taxes on, on any of the distributions and don't pay taxes on the revenue. So the, the other part that's really cool is in the OZs, you can double up uh, or take additional advantages of the pre-existing tax code, right? So when, when you look at the, the already existing uh, uh, tax code where you get depletion allowance, depreciation, IDC deductions, these all are in addition to uh, the opportunity zone tax law, right? Uh, so all of that is part and part of, of using oil and gas. And uh, again, kind of a, a unique world. And I, I don't have to go too much into detail because the simplicity of it is this, we're able to make really substantial distributions during the life cycle and alongside it pass through the losses that come in oil and gas to make the revenue tax-free during the life cycle of our funds. Uh, in addition to giving some other tax benefits along the way. So kind of fun. Again, I mentioned this before, but for us, this isn't a theory. Uh, for the last several years, we've been doing this in multiple funds. And at the end of the day, what gets really exciting is when you start with a project that starts with six or 69 or 58 wells, uh, when you, instead of distributing all the money, you only distribute the 6% of the revenue. And when you reinvest the rest, you grow this portfolio, right? So 
over a couple of years, 130 wells com come into 300 wells. Uh, and over 10 years, 200 wells become 1,000 wells in a portfolio that keep generating more and more cash flow to the investors. And after 10 years, when you sell all of the assets and all the proceeds, all of the gains, all of the prior revenue, all of the prior depreciation, depletion, everything you've taken advantage of is not subject to tax. And that's a really awesome arbitrage, right? How do you get to a one and a half, a two and a half, a three and a half, a four and a half times return on an investment and not pay taxes on the backside, right? When you really look at the tax equivalent yield of an opportunity zone, it's just the best medium we have found to invest in the energy space, right? Take all the other tax codes combined, there's nothing else that can do what an op zone does for us and our investors uh, on an after-tax basis. And so for us, we get super excited uh, about this compounding reinvestment, right? And the beauty of that is in oil and gas, you don't, when you're drilling in these super uh, repeatable large wells, these 10 to $12 million wells in the core of the Permian Basin, and you're doing it with hundreds of millions or, or billions of dollars on a repeat basis, the returns are, are pretty predictable, uh, especially when you get to the scale that we're at uh, and you're drilling hundreds of wells, they look very similar. Uh, and, and to be able to, to reinvest that heavy upfront cash flow, right? If you, if you drill a well, you might only get one and a half or two and a half times your money. But you get it so quickly that if you're constantly reinvesting and compounding it, the, the, the growth of the fund and the assets can grow exponentially. And most oil and gas doesn't do that, right? You drill it and it depletes out over time until it has less value as you cash flow it all out. But if you constantly reinvest the proceeds, you're in essence creating your own middle, uh, uh, little oil company that is a tax-free enterprise. So again, I, I get super excited. Uh, of this year, we've already deployed about $400 million and about 65 million was already in op zones. Uh, the, the fund raised about 30, $40 million at the point when this was uh, designed and it bought a portion of all the wells that were already in the op zones. But we don't do anything different. This area of operations is no different then we focus as a company, right? Lee and Eddie County, New Mexico, uh, uh, Reeves uh, Ward and Lovey County in, in uh, Texas. That's our core operations regardless of the op zone tax law. Uh, it just so happens that most of what we do falls into the op zone anyways, and we put it under this tax wrapper. And again, I, what, what is really interesting for us is when you look at all these little lines, blue or gray, whatever your color of your screen is, these are in-field opportunities that you're just drilling over and over and over again, right? Uh, and so these are the first series of wells in this fund that we participated in. They're already cash flowing for the investors. Uh, we, we've already earned about 25% in the fund and distributed the first 3% to investors. Uh, we cap it at 6% a year, and we just keep reinvesting the proceeds over and over again. So for us, it's just a, it's a great world to live in, uh, this big data repeat, rinse, wash, uh, and, and into the op zone structure. So uh, again, Jimmy, I'm a little biased. Uh, I, I find this to be the best part of, of the tax code. I hope it goes on indefinitely uh, because I think it's the biggest wealth arbitrage for wealthy clients. And the one thing that most wealthy clients have in common is we all tend to have a lot of capital gains. And so being able to turn those capital gains into a mega Roth, I think is the greatest arbitrage, especially when we look at that $35 trillion national deficit they're looking to us to come pay it. And so the more that we can do to put into this tax-free bucket, the, the more we're going to uh, take advantage of that over the long term. And the deferral on tax is really, really cool, right? Being able to defer it for a couple of years. In fact, with us, you're typically able to reduce it by 50 to 70% as well. And, and I won't go into the, the nuances of how unless someone asks, uh, but the real value of the op zone is turning a taxable asset into a tax-free asset. And, and yes, do you have to stay in op zones for 10 years to do so? You do. You don't have to stay in one op zone, but you have to stay in op zones uh, for a long period of time in order to take that tax advantage or that tax-free benefit. But it is such a really amazing opportunity for investors that I think that it'll become bigger and bigger here over the next couple of years as this uh, law hopefully gets renewed and extended. So uh, with that, Jimmy, I thought I would open it up if you're okay for some Q and A. If not, yeah, I'll, no, we're, I'll we're yeah, we're good. We're we're a little over time, so I'll just uh, oh, we'll sorry. Just very, very quickly, um, George asks. Uh, he wants to talk to you. He says, "Hey, how can I contact Matt?" So what's the, what's the best way to reach out to you and your team if uh, we have anybody interested in getting more information or picking your brain? I um, thought I would have the number on there. I don't. Uh, so let me put in the chat box here if I can sure. extend this and just type in. 
I'll give my number here, but I have a, a entire team uh, that can help out as well. So if someone just texts me, shoots me an email, uh, whatever it may be, there's my cell phone number and here's my email. I will make sure that we get right back at, at you. Excellent. Um, and then a, a couple other questions also. Um, this one, this one comes from me. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole tax benefit of OZ investing is after 10 years you sell and it's worth more than it was when you first invested. So you get to escape completely mm -hmm. tax-free. But when you're doing oil and gas drilling, you're depleting those wells, right? And it, yeah. it is, is how often is it the case that it's worth more at the end of a 10 year hold than it is at the beginning? Help me, help me understand what I'm, what I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, so our, I mean, our first four funds are kind of the perfect iteration of this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just drilled your initial wells and you let them decline, they would have less value, right? Those initial wells, but you're constantly reinvesting the cash flow, right? So if, if you start with a $100 million portfolio and you're growing that uh, by reinvesting 60, 70, $80 million a year back in the ground, right? What you're starting with is you go from 100 wells to 500 wells. And even though the original wells have less value, the new wells have exponentially more value, right? So uh, uh, right now, the last several funds, and there's no way to say this happens every year, but in, in a very short period of time, in just a couple of years, uh, we've more than one and a half and two X most of our funds in a very short period of time. Um, and, and again, we, we're not gonna say that happens every single two, three year period of time, uh, but the value, because you're drilling more wells, right? And you're getting multiples on return from each well that you deploy, uh, the IRR is so high that you're compounding that you're basically growing an oil company, right? So that, I yeah. And then I think that's, I think that is actually it right there. It's like, you're not investing just in these specific wells. You're investing in the business of oil exploration and drilling. So uh, by the yeah. way, I got that question uh, from more than one person after you presented last time. And I kind of held it on, <laughs> held onto it for a little while because I, I was yeah. curious about that as well. Uh, Sal chimes in and says, the George Steinbrenner of oil wells putting the money back on the field. I get it and I love it. So yeah, thanks for the comment there, Sal. And then uh, one more question here from Chuck and then I got to move on to our next presenter, Matt. Yep. He, he asked, when is the Permian Basin projected to run dry? Hopefully not for at least another 10 years or so, right? <laughs> So run run dry is interesting question. What will happen is as the, the majors control the majority of the best inventory. So if you're not partnering with the majors, it's hard to get really good inventory. And it would be said that, yeah, maybe they have 10 to 12 years of their tier one, one plus one A acreage. What starts to happen is you go out into the Permian. The geology maybe is as good, but it's not proven yet. And so normally what will happen is it's not running dry anytime soon. It'll either get gassier like a lot of mature plays or people will move out in the curve and it'll be a higher dollar cost break even, right? If you break even at, at $40 or $30 a barrel now, it might be 50 or 60 because the average reserves are slightly lower or the, the cost is harder because the infrastructure is not there. So it's not going to run dry in anyone's lifetime or their kid's lifetime or even a fathomable future. The gas will produce for the next 100 years. So we don't even work, or maybe 400 years. The oil side will deplete more rapidly it's the cost of getting it that goes up over time as you get away from the most prolific part of the basin, right? Doesn't go to zero, just starts to deplete at a more rapid rate. And it, usually the composition of more mature fields will end up being gassier, more natural gas, less oil. Right now it's 85, 90% oil, even though it's two BCF plus of gas on all these wells, it's still much more oil. And that'll start to switch over time as you move away from the core. In the next 10 to 15 years, you'll start to see much more gassier wells less oil production. Very good. Matt, uh, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your continued support of, of OZ Insiders, our mastermind group that you're a member of, and, and of OpportunityZones.com and of today's event, OZ Pitch Day. Great to, great to get your presentation again. Uh, let's do this again in 2025 a few times, Matt. I, I think it'd, it'd be great to continue to share this product with, uh, with our audience going forward. Right, so buddy. thank you so much. Great talking to you, man. Thanks, Matt.